All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Everything College World Podcast. Today, me and Nick are be doing our week one predictions. Saturday, Sunday, and the Monday games. We already did Thursday and Friday's games, so if you'd like to check that out, the link will be in the bio or down below. And then uh, we have time stamps for every game here. If you're looking to skip around, uh, you know, Nick, the first three weeks of college football, you know, kind of dry. I mean, we do have some really stellar matchups, you know, like Alabama, Texas, and whatnot. But for the most part, you know, it's kind of a weak slate. I think for a lot of teams, it's really a find your footing type of month here in September and you know we have a handful of solid games in week one that are going to showcase that you know what are your first thoughts on the first three weeks of college football right there's a few couple a couple games here on this slate that I like this weekend a lot of these teams that are getting tune-up matches you know some teams can find out their personnel kind of get comfortable if they have a new offense new defensive coordinator that type of thing kind of adjust to the new season some of these teams welcome in some pretty poor opponents to their home stadium kick it off but we do have some interesting matchups that we're going to highlight that i think can really kind of tell how a season's going to go for a team matchups. just in this early slate for the first three games we're looking at here kind of can tell how the team's offense is going to go and what they can do with that one of those matchups you're talking about kind of a tune-up here michigan 30 and a half point favorites over colorado state you know jay norvell moves over from nevada to coach this ball club he transfers here on offense you know clay millen comes over from Nevada, as does Troy Horton, Elquan Stovall at wide receiver. They also have Ty McCullough coming back with 17 yards per catch for this ball club. Here, I think the offense with the new uh, you know, implemented air raid and some familiar faces coming over, I think it's going to start to take shape this year. I don't think this will be a bad ball team. They had, you know, I don't know line, four transfers overall. It's pretty bad old line from a season ago. Ajon Vivens takes over running back, you know, 164 yards per game for this ground game. So, I think Howard State has an interesting offense, so I do think they'll find the scoreboard at least twice here. You know, I think in garbage time they'll find it. Uh, you know, it's a solid Colorado State pass rush. Muhammad Kamba leaves that. But I think overall, you know, this is going to be a cakewalk for Michigan. They have good balance on offense. But I think the biggest storyline is to find out who's next up on defense because obviously they replace a lot of talent. I think we get three starters back on this unit. I'm looking at guys like Taylor Upshaw, Mike Morris, Jalen Harrell. Those are the guys I'm kind of eyeing to see who steps up. And I'm also curious to see if Will Johnson gets on the field and what his role will be. It's just as a blowout for Michigan, but again, there's plenty to look for in this game. Right, I think this is an interesting for the defense. They replace so much to have this season step up here. I want to see Mozzie Smith, you know, have a strong day on the defensive line. I also look at the quarterback battle. You know, Cade McNamara is going to start this week. Then McCarthy is going to start the next week. Jim Harbaugh going a very interesting decision here. I, I don't think I've ever really seen this in college football where they start one quarterback week one, start a different quarterback week two. But when you play these type of opponents, you kind of have that luxury to do so. How is Cade going to look on Saturday? Is he going to be comfortable? Is he going to be able to spread the ball out? You know, he's hasn't been great at that over the past couple of seasons. They have relied on the run game at times. Will he be able to find his footing in this game against Colorado State and earn himself that starting job? Looking at NC State and East Carolina, also on the 12 p.m. slate on ESPN. 11.5 point line for a team I have making the playoffs in the Wolfpack. And this could be an interesting trap game if they let those expectations kind of get to their head here because ECU – Slouch. Look at offense. Holden Allers, you know, he's been around forever, it seems. Has a nice group of weapons to work with. Guys like C.J. Johnson, Josiah Hatfield. They also picked up three transfers. Isaiah Winstead, Jalen Johnson, some of the notables there, wide receiver. 3,100-plus uh, yards, 24 touchdowns. This is his fifth year now as a starter, so this guy's seen a little bit of everything. So I don't think this uh, very talented NC State defense will face him too much. Pass pro needs to be better, though. You know, the offense needs to be more explosive this year. That's why they averaged under 30 points per game last year when they probably shouldn't have. Because they also have a nice backfield of Raji. Uh, Harris, three and a half yards per carry, almost 600 yards, and then 1,100 yard rusher, Keith Mitchell. So this is a very interesting offense. They're facing a the defense gets 10 starters back, Nick. These guys were great. You know, the front six is the elite. Corey Durden, he's kind of that guy that allows his linebacker to clean things up. And I mean, oh boy, what a trio it is. Uh, Peyton Wilson, Isaiah Moore, Drake Thomas, one of the nation's best linebacking trios. They also have great size on the D line and Joshua Harris, CJ Clark. It's a deep uh, first three. And again, the linebackers are phenomenal. It's good depth as well. Uh, Shaheen Battle and Tyler Baker Williams. You know, they lead a secondary against everyone back from last year. And I think they can match up in these nickel sets. I think they'll have no problem slowing down the run. And that right there is a big key, you know, defending this passing attack. You know, NC State, their second in FBS as opponent completion rate allowed last year. It's kind of funny because ECU last year opened the season versus App State, who led the nation in completion rate in 2020. And they were held check in that game. So obviously, I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. Looking at ECU's defense, you know, they don't possess relatively good size on the D-line, especially on the interior, but they still got productive pass rushers from there. You know, guys like Elijah Morris, uh, Emmanuel Hickman was pretty solid as a freshman. I like Jeremy Lewis coming off the edge. So this is an interesting front seven. I think they can dice things up a bit. You know, guys like Miles Berry, Xavier Smith, the run defense, you know, they were pretty good last year, but I do think the Grant Gibson led O-line with Jordan Houston. They'll find some room while, you know, Devin Leary and a good group of pass catchers like Devin Carter and Derek Thomas 
face a secondary that, you know, I think they'll take a step back for the most part. But Malik Fleming, he was good at corner. Uh, Jairo Wilson was a solid safety for them. I think there's secondary this year going to regress for ECU, and you'll see it here in this game. Again, NC State, they're going to want to make a statement. This is a legit trap game. to let those expectations get to them. I don't think they will. 38-13 for me. How do you feel about this game? Because it is no slouch, but you have a blowout. So what are your thoughts? Right, I think NC State's a team that you and I are both very high on, both have them making the playoffs. When you look at the schedule on the schedule, you know, they travel to ECU away. You know those fans in Greenville are going to be very hyped for this game. That crowd's going to be loud in the first quarter and second quarter. It's going to be a very tough environment to play in. But I think with the amount of returning starters that NC State has, these guys are veterans. They have played in tough environments before. They're going to find themselves comfortable. I love Devin Leary. I think he has some serious potential to put up a ton of points on the board on Saturday. I like to see Devin Carter involved early on, maybe run the ball a couple couple of times in the early first starts of the drive, get comfortable with the game, kind of find a groove for NC State as they get back on this offense. And the defense, you know, I'm comfortable with this NC State defense. I think they're really solid top to bottom. Thomas as well perform on Saturday. I think this will be a close game at halftime. I think it'll be maybe a one score, even closer game at half. State finds its foot in the second half. They will blow blow away and pull away of ECU and put a, put a big statement win on the board week one as they try to meet those expectations that have been set this offseason. North Carolina and Appalachian State, probably the hardest game to predict on this slate just because North Carolina, they got a tune-up against FAMU, but they allowed 24 points. The secondary wasn't all that great. They gave up a handful of drives to that offense. It was a three-point line at one point. Now it's only one and a half in favor of the Tar Heels. ESPNU will be covering this game. You know, I think the biggest thing to watch is this backfield of App State. Uh, Cam Peoples, 126 yards, 14 touchdowns. Nate Noel, 1,100-plus yards. Chase Bryce, he was very good after coming over from Clemson last year, but App State does lose a great deal of production at pass catcher Christian Wells. He's one of the notables. He's next up, 5'11", 180. But um, they added two transfers, but Christian Horn, Deshaun Davis, they're back, but not much returning production. You know, that can't be said about the O-line, though. Four seniors are back up front for them. They're going to be facing, you know, Travis Shaw, Miles Murphy, an interesting little D-line that, uh, you know, Power Eccles as well at linebacker stepped up last week. Interesting front seven for UNC. I think they'll be able to uh, you know, I think they'll do their job for the most part. I think they'll keep this running game in check. But, of course, that's been kind of a struggle area at times for UNC. Um, the biggest thing, well, again, that secondary, I'm not sure if I'm just playing. Uh, Storm Duck, he definitely will. He's obviously one of the top corners. I think that Gene Chizik's going to look at the film. And all week long, they've been studying, and they've been doing a great job of trying to kind of cover up some of the mishaps they had last week. So I think they'll be much better this week against the pass for App State. Great defense, 22 points per game allowed last year, 344 yards per game allowed. They do lose numerous stars. You get a few back, like Nick Hampton, 17 and a half tackle for loss, 11 sacks coming off the edge. Then Brenton Harrington, that linebacker, he's going to be a big star for them. Um, I, I like the secondary, though. Stephen Jones, a corner, five picks last year, eight pass breakups. He's going to be tasked with covering Josh Downs, which is obviously a very tough ask for anybody. And there's a few vets in this back end that only allowed 57% completion rate season to go with 15 picks. Uh, you know, again, it's still a tough game, to pick, but I do think that the UNC secondary are going to be much better than they were last week, and I think they'll crack down on the run a good bit. I do think this will be a close game because UNC, I uh, expect them to be a little bit more one-dimensional in this game because Appalachian State, um, they're tough. I don't, 122 yards per game allowed on the ground last year. They're tough. They're disciplined. I think they can be physical enough to kind of slow down this run. But Drake May, I think uh, he's going to kind of take over, kind of like he did last week with five touchdowns, and I think that will be the difference maker in this one. But really a close game, tough one to pick. This is an exciting game to have early on in the day. You know, earlier this week, I would have had, before UNC played Florida a and I would have had them probably winning by 7 to 10 points. That defense, defensive showing really let me down. The secondary did not look poor, did not look good at all. Gene Chizik really has a lot to work on here. You know, they're traveling to Boone. It's going to be loud. I heard tickets are going for an insane price. That, that stadium is sold out. App State's getting up for this one. They really care about this game. And I don't blame them. This is a huge game for the program if they can knock off UNC. I just think Drake May has enough talent on offense to lead this team to a vic- to a tight victory. I loved how composed he looked. He felt comfortable, had a strong showing against Florida AM. He really took over, made made it very clear early on that he should have been the pick to be the starter. I know there was, some, there was a QB battle in Chapel Hill. I like Josh Downs to have a big day as well. I think Storm Duck will step up and make some plays, hopefully on the secondary. You know, it's all about this offense for me. Can they continue to put up points? And then I look at the defense. Will they be able to step up? The secondary has to improve. Last week wasn't good enough. Yeah, I think one of the biggest reasons I think that they'll struggle to kind of run in this game. I know that 300 plus yards last week had great balance, but this O line for UNC, it was very poor last year, and it replaced numerous guys that went to the NFL. That's one of the things we talked about in this team's preview is how much turnover they had on a unit that was not very good one bit. But I do think guys like Noah Taylor and Power Eccles will step up for them and they'll get them off the field. But I do think this will be a close game. As always, like you said, the ticket prices are pretty absurd for this game. Um, looking at some other notable games on the early slates, not too much. Sam Houston State travels to take on Texas A&M. A little tune up there. Maryland and Buffalo. 
UCLA you know, against the Bowling Green team that should compete for their conference this year. A very experienced ball club. Should be interesting to see if they can make a contest out of that there. And then Navy, Air Force, Virginia, Iowa State, they're all going to host some FCS foes. Rutgers and Boston College on ACC Network, Nick. This might be a little interesting game because I think, uh, you know, the secondary Rutgers pretty underrated. Max Melton, Robert Lightbean, Avery Young. They got some really good ball players and some veterans in the back end. They might have something to say about this passing game that gets back Phil Jerkovich, Zay Flowers, and Jalen Gill. So I think that's going to be a fun matchup to watch. Uh, I think Rutgers, I think it's seven and a half point is the line. I think they will cover that. I don't know how they're going to score points, but I think they'll get this one done on the road. Uh, I think Boston College will win, but I think Rutgers will cover, keep it close. You know, that culture is kind of changing there uh, in New Jersey. So I think Rutgers will be an interesting game for them to earn some respect. Yeah, I'm excited for this game. I think it's a cool matchup to have early on in the day. I, thought, I like it out of conference schedule. I think the offense for Rutgers will look better this year. I like picking up Taj Harris and Sean Ryan out of the transfer portal. Both these guys have some serious experience as senior transfers. I worry about the quarterback play a little bit. Is is Noah Verdell going to be able to control that, be in charge there, have a good season? I hope he does. I look at the defense. The defense is strong. Secondary looks good. Is this BC flying, uh, high-flying passing attack going to be that this year? Phil Jerkovich is back. He got some weapons with Flowers coming back. Super talented wide receiver that may have flirted with transferring, but he ends up staying in Chestnut Hill. This is a very underrated matchup for the week. I'm excited to see how these team two play. They're both very equal to each other, in my opinion. It's going to be a close four points the Rutgers should cover the seven and a half definitely a game to keep your eye on early on on Saturday yeah I like Tosh Harris as well it's pretty uh, veteran receiving core as well so for it all a big opportunity for him to shine but I do think that you know what Josh DeBerry led secondary of Boston College there last year it's gonna be too much to conquer and this team can't really run the ball they haven't for years so that's gonna be it for the early slate very interesting way to get our college football Saturday kicked off moving to Atlanta, Georgia will host Oregon, ranked number 11 after a very, you know, the, both these teams have pretty opposite ends to the year. You know, Oregon loses all their coaches. Uh, they lost three, four, and I think it was, about, yeah, they lost three of their last four games. Georgia, on the other hand, won the national championship. So 17 and a half, 17 point line here in favor of the Bulldogs. Bo Nix, familiar foe here, reunites with Kenny Dillingham, you know. He's never been consistent over four quarters, but he's showcased before how impressive he is as a battalion. You know, he's a great runner, can make plays out of the pocket. He's coming off a career best year, I would say. They lose plenty of skill at running back. They do got guys like Byron Cardwell and Noah Whittington. I think they also picked up uh, it was Marquise Irving from uh, Minnesota. Best chance here in this game, though, for Oregon is the offensive line. Obviously, they were pretty poor in the trenches against Utah, but you have Dan Lanning who comes over, who you're hoping has instilled some more discipline on this offensive front. TJ Bass, you know, he moved the tackle and still shine. I think he might pivot back inside. It appears a great run blocker. Him and veteran Alex Forsythe at center. I like Stephen Jones. He's been a little bit at tackle. You know, again, they got pushed around against Utah. But, um, and they're going to have to control the interior D-line of Georgia. It's a very young group after a lot of turnover. So I'd say this is a winnable matchup, but can they win it? Because I don't know. Because Jalen Carter, he's going to be tough to defend. I think that they have the personnel in the interior, but I still think they'll get bodied. I like Chris Huston, Tro Franklin, Dante Thornton. You know, these guys are all uh, highly ranked recruits that have stuck around after Mario Cristobal departs. So I think they might have something for a Keely Ringo-led secondary. Um, they don't have a lot of size, so they're going to have to win with speed and playmaking. I do think it's certainly possible. I think the biggest thing for Georgia, though, here is just stay ahead of the sticks. Because the Oregon secondary, they return Bennett Williams. They add Christian Gonzalez, who is a heck of a ball player. Some really good size of 200 pounds who can really run stride for stride. So I think let's stay away from challenging them. I do like Brock Bowers down the seam. They're pretty deep at receiver overall. Guys like Ladd McContney, Kyrus Jackson, A.D. Mitchell. But I think they, they can win on the ground because this Oregon, the interior D-line, I think it's a really good unit. But overall, they don't have much pass rush. So I guess you could try to win through the air. But I still think they're going to grind down this front of DJ Johnson, Brandon Dorless, some solid ball players, even Keon Ware Hudson and another senior in Umavai. But I think last year you kind of saw what this group was made of. I do like Dan Lennon coming over uh, because the run defense was good last year, but the final four weeks it really fell off and now personnel's kind of an issue because the pass rush last year, Nick, was quite weak, even with Kayvon Thibodeau. Braden Swinson coming back is big for them. I want to see some more uh, play out of him because after he came back from injury last year, it was not very good. And then Mace Funa, I think he's going to have to move down to a pass rushing role, which I don't know if that's going to mold well for them. Uh, good news for Oregon, though, like I said about the secondaries, they also have Justin Flo and Noah Sewell at linebacker. Those guys are one of the top duos in the country. How do you feel about this game? I see you have a pretty wide score, and I can understand it because Oregon was pretty disappointing last year. But I do think if this team plays up to their potential, they can really keep it close. So I'm staying conservative 35 17. I think Georgia's going to win with the running game, control the clock, make their plays on defense, and they'll just get out of Atlanta with a pretty simple, easy win. 
Right, I think this will be more of a blowout because I look at this, uh, what you said for Oregon. Don't get dominated in the trenches. I have a feeling that Georgia is going to absolutely dominate them on the offensive side of the trenches and the defensive side of the ball. I know this is a new front seven for Georgia. They replace a whole lot with players losing to the NFL draft. But I think they'll be able to contain Bo Nix, make him make a few mistakes. You know, he gets a little happy feet sometimes, throw the ball when he shouldn't, throws a pick or two here and there. So I think that's going to happen on Saturday. I think was this front seven for Georgia's going to reload. They're going to bring a lot of talent in, and they're, those guys are going to step up early on. i also like to see Brock Bowers have a huge day. I think he'll be involved in mo- multiple facets of the offense as, as Stetson Bennett tries to find his feet and continue to build off of last year. What was a, was a bit of a surprising season from him for me. He looked a little bit better than I thought he would. I just think that Georgia has too much talent on the defensive side of the ball to, to have Oregon even put up any points, really. It's going to be a blowout for me. I don't, don't think this is too close of a game. Interesting matchup out of conference. I like the scheduling here, but I just think that this Georgia team has too much talent for Oregon, and it should be a blowout. Too much physicality as well. I think that'd be another point to add there. But like you said, it's gonna be hard for Knicks with Robert Beal and Nolan Smith coming at you off the edge to make things happen. I do want to see who gets the go on the interior D line outside of Carter. You know, is, is your stack house Zion Logue, Warren Brinson? Who's it gonna be? Because this group is really up for grabs, and that's really what we're gonna find out. They're really just playing this game to find out who the starters are gonna be to dominate all year long. That's pretty much what you're saying about this game. So I can totally understand it. 35-17 for me. I think McIntosh, uh, he's going to have a good game, one of the ball. See what happens for 35-17 for me. Hopefully it's competitive at least for a half. But on the other hand of things, you know, we have another game at 3.30. It's going to be pretty interesting, Nick. Cincinnati takes on Arkansas. You know, what of a well of a game this would have been last year. Cincinnati making the playoffs. Arkansas is winning, you know, I think eight or nine games. So it would have been a heck of a matchup last year. They're going to start things off this year as a ranked contest. Desmond Ritter's gone. OC Mike Denbrock's gone. Running back Jerome Ford is also departing. Corey Kenner comes over, though, from LSU. And around him's a variety of returning pass catchers, Tyler Scott and Trey Tucker. These guys have a lot of speed. Uh, Jane Thompson, well, he's 187 pounds. They get all five starters back on O-line. Uh, ben Bryant comes back. You know, he was with the team from 2018 to 2020. Went to Eastern Michigan for a year. I guess some experience under his belt, 3,100-plus yards. And now he's back. So that's pretty interesting style here on offense, really. That You don't see that really happen ever. Bryant's back. He's been in the locker room before, so he's not really a new starter, I would say, because he understands the system. He understands this locker room. He understands, you know, what Luke Fickle's looking to get out of this offense. Josh Wiley as well, 332 yards and six touchdowns at tight end. I think this offense is quite serviceable. We'll see what Kinner can do behind this veteran offensive line. I think the biggest thing for Arkansas, though, is this defense. They don't have much of a pass rush, at least in my eyes. You know, the higher power offenses last year just had a field day with 513 yards per game allowed in their four losses. They were just so lifeless, it seemed, against the Ole Miss run, the Alabama pass. You know, this defense was great last year because they were able to get off the field. 15th and third down conversion rate. They're phenomenal in the red zone. But they replaced a lot of starters in the front seven. Grant Morgan, John Ridgway, most importantly, Trey Williams, who was just such a force off the edge. Zach Williams, Eric Gregory, some good rotational help. Those guys are going to be expected to step up. More importantly, the 6'7", 270-pound defensive end, Trent Jackson. He's got some good get-off. Nice bend for that size. He's really going to have to lead this pass rushing department. I think that's going to be their biggest struggle this year. You patch that up with a secondary that Nick was really just not good at times. You know, eight man drops and Alabama was still beating them downfield. Like they were just seemed so lifeless. You know, Ladarius Bishop wasn't great, man. You know, it's a revamp safety group. I think Miles Slusher is going to have a good year. Jalen Catalan is one of the nation's best. You know, he's a downhill thumper. He can also cover. So he's really coming back to help lead these guys. Let's say Latavius Brand comes over from Georgia. He wasn't much of a coverage asset, though. We'll see what happens. I think the speed here with the lack of pass rush is really going to hurt this Arkansas defense. But I think that they're going to control the clock. They're going to run the ball well. Because last year against Alabama, Cincinnati in the playoffs, they played a pretty good game for what was expected. But one thing that was very noticeable that controlled the game is that Brian Robinson and Alabama absolutely stuffed him. That was not a good offensive line last year, and they absolutely dominated the Cincinnati D line. I do like their 3-3-5, and I think guys like Ivan Pace come over and then join his brother Deshaun is going to do wonders for them. But they, um, they they have seniors on the D-line, like Malik Van, Jabari Taylor, Jawan Briggs. But I think that that biggest difference here is K.J. Jefferson, Dunn, it's going to be plays, and Raheem Sanders running behind guys like Ricky Stromberg, Adult Wagner, 6'9", 330. That's going to be the difference maker. I think they're really going to control the clock, Nick, in this game. Pass throw was shaky at times, so I think that Cincinnati can really get after it. But I think they're going to control the clock. They're going to run the ball well. They're going to really grind down this Cincinnati D-line. That's why I have them winning this game 28-21. I totally agree. I think the running game is the key for this Arkansas team. I want to see them run the ball a ton. Sanders is such a good back. I like to see him carry the ball a lot. KJ Jefferson, I like the dynamic he brings returning. 
I think the defense, you know, I definitely see a step back for this Arkansas defense, but they do have some leadership with Bumper Pool. I do worry they don't return as much as you would hope for this Arkansas team, but I think they just find themselves in a good position. As long as they can avoid third and five, third and six, third and seven, that kind of range, they should be okay. Anything longer than third and five, they can find themselves in trouble. Get ahead of the, uh, ahead of the chains here, get comfortable with that. Pick up some big gains on first down. I think this team will be great in that regard. As long as they can do that, I can see them winning this game by two touchdowns, but it should be, it could potentially be closer. I like the scheduling at a conference. It's a very interesting matchup. I like it on this on the slate week one. Very cool to see this. So I think this should be an exciting game. It may be a little closer than what I predicted, but it's certainly an interesting one, and people should be paying attention to this matchup for sure. It's been interesting to see who emerges that wide receiver for Arkansas. Jaden Hazelwood transfers over. Great fit for this offense with his blocking abilities. They added Matt Landers from Toledo. Georgia before that, late here in the cycle. Warren Thompson was pretty productive downfield last year. And Keetron, Keetron Jackson, I think he'll get involved some this season. Kind of a, you know, Traylon Burks kind of comparison there. We'll see if we can get that out of them. But overall, yeah, I think this will be a pretty good game. be fun to watch Cincinnati try to slow down this running attack. And again, like I said, I think that's secondary against these receivers with the lack of a pass rush. I think that's something really the monitor that not really a lot of people are talking about. A lot of people are not happy with how I feel about Arkansas. But that's what I see. And we'll see if they prove me wrong. Should be a fun year for the Hogs if they can figure out negatives. Looking at Houston and UTSA, you know, this is a really I had Houston when I kind of went back and looked at things. Looking at UTSA, I think we're going to see a lot of offense here. Clayton Toon, he was phenomenal last year. He stepped up after four picks in the, you know, in the first game of the year last season against Texas Tech. Only had 10 on the year, so he had six more after that. 3,500 yards, 30 touchdowns. Does lose two of his top three pass catchers, but Nathan Dell is the lone attorney. 90 grabs, 1,300 yards. 12 touchdowns. He was great. One of the nation's best. By like Christian Trahan. He's one of my favorite tight ends. They're going to get him involved a good bit. You know, almost 40 grabs a season ago. Big loss, though, in Alton McGaskill. Tore his ACL in the spring. One of the top freshman running backs from a season ago. They don't have that one-two punch anymore, but Tazan Henry was good for them last year. Offensive line needs to be better. He was one of the nation's worst in college football last year. And they're facing a defense that, you know, there was a solid unit. 25 points per game allowed. But they don't have that presence off the edge like they did last year of Clarence Hicks and Charles Wiley and I don't think they have the personnel in the D-line that take advantage of this poor O-line so we'll see what happens in that area top safety Rashad Wisdom only 5'9 but he's a team high tackle of 88 stops Jamal Ligdon at linebacker I like him as well Frank Harris though he's back 3,100 yards 27 touchdowns big breakout year for him also added 561 and 6 scores Traylon Smith replaces Sincere McCormick coming over from Arkansas's so um, they're going to be good in the running back department. This passing game, Nick's going to be phenomenal. They return all their draft-eligible pass catchers. Akari Franklin, 1,000 yards. Joshua Smith, a little over. And then, you know, south of 800 yards, DeCorey and Clark. You know, they overall return top four pass catchers. I think they're going to do good against the secondary. The secondary was pretty good. They replaced starters, including Marcus Jones. And they have absurd size on the O-line. I think that's really going to be the difference maker. Now, I know this Houston defensive front is incredible. Derek Parrish, DeAnthony. Atlas Bell and Latrell Banks and were phenomenal for them last year. They have great depth. You know, size, not so much, though. It's going to kind of be a disadvantage, I think, here. One thing, though, is they really get off the field. You know, led the nation in third down defense a season ago. Only 20 points per game allowed. But I think I'm going to take this offensive line to perform more better more often than not here. And I think they'll take advantage of a secondary. It's got some youth in it. I'm going to take UTSA in this game purely because of that. I think it's some pretty solid analysis on why I picked the road runners here. Originally, I picked Houston in the preseason, but here... I'm going to take UTSA at home to get things done in the Alamo Dome. This is an exciting one for me. I think UTSA has a real chance to win this game. The over-under at 61.5 Vegas obviously believe that this will be a shootout. I think we both agree. Both these offenses are high-flying and should put up a ton of points. I love this UTSA offense. I think Frank Harris is a solid quarterback. Glad to see him back. Clayton Toon as well. Excited to see what he can do for Houston this year. Houston comes off of what was a really strong year last year, a better than expected year in 2021. I think that Houston just has enough talent on defense to kind of maybe slow down this Houston offense at times and hold them to 24 points for me, which would be a pretty big win for Houston, in my opinion, if they can hold them just to 24 points. This UTSA offense put up a ton of points last year. This is an exciting game, the Alamo Dome. Interesting place to have. I know this UTSA's home stadium. Should be exciting to see what that looks like. Crowd should be ramped up for this one in-state matchup i like this a lot interesting schedule here good game at 330 i'm gonna take houston just because i believe the defense has a little bit more and will be able to hold that utsa offense and check control Traylon smith make sure he doesn't pick up any big gains make frank harris throw the ball as much as possible i think that will be the success for houston i think they'll play in their advantage though you don't want them throwing they outscore western kentucky last year uh in the conference championship game i know they kind of turned it over a little bit but still i mean that's an offense you have it seems 
Look at some of the other notable games on midday slate. Arizona, San Diego State. That's an interesting one. Arizona, a lot of youth there for Jed Fish. Uh, Jaden DeWara comes over. Uh, Jacob Cowing comes over from UTEP, who takes on Oklahoma. I think that's going to be a fun game, though. Arizona and San Diego State, very tough defense. I'm very interested to see what Braxton Burmeister does as well. They finally have a serviceable quarterback. And, you know, he can really rip it. He's got some speed as well. So I think that Burmeister, very excited to see what he can do. Big opportunity against being kind of a lifeless defense. Very young team, though, excited for Arizona this season. UTEP, again, though, against Oklahoma. And you know, him, Brent Venables, and Lincoln Riley, they're both going to be making their debuts here on this mid afternoon slate. And you'll see BYU and Miami in action. You know, kind of what are your thoughts on these games? Because I think uh, we're really interested to see what Jeff Levy's offense looks like. And Lincoln Riley's as well against Rice. Two cakewalks here. Both of these teams will win by 30, 40 plus points. But still, we're very excited to see how these guys do in their debuts. Right. I look at the USC game. I think it's an interesting way to start off the tenure. Lincoln Riley's offense. I want to see how they can sort of gel together and perform on this. The line right now is 32 and a half. I think Rice could potentially cover that considering I don't know how many points uh, USC will put up. I'm also concerned about that defense. That's an exciting game to kind of kick things off for me. I like Oklahoma at UTEP as well. Kind of see what Venable's defense looks like early on. How does the offense play as well for in Norman? Miami too. Is Miami going to be as good as people expect them this year? This Obviously, this game against Bethel Cookman is not going to show us a whole lot, but I'd like to see how that offense kind of fits together. Tyler Van Dyke is a solid quarterback. i love to see what he can do. Mario Cristobal's coaching debut, of course. BYU-USF, the line right now is 12, minus 12 to BYU. I think that's a bit bit of a tough line for BYU. I think they're a lot better than that against a poor USF team. Is BYU going to be able to come out and put a ton of points on the board early in the game? This team has a lot of love in the offseason. A lot of people expect them to do well against a tough schedule. Is BYU going to perform a week one up to our expectations? Yeah, that really is a disrespectful line for BYU. But Vegas, I mean, these guys have proven time after time they know something that we don't. But, I mean, travel from Utah all the way up to Tampa. But, again, they should have no issues with that team. USC week two, they play at Stanford. So we'll see if that defense can make some improvements to be prepared for that offense. It can really dice things up. Tonight, Cap Nick, this is probably the most exciting part of week one. Utah versus Florida kicks things off at 7 on ESPN. Probably the most important game in the history of the Pac-12 for all their teams. They have no respect left either because they just can't seem to perform when they're expected to. I know that Oregon plays Georgia, but we don't expect Oregon to do anything. We expect Utah to win this game and not just you win it by two and a half or three points like the Lions and Jet by, you know, complete domination, really. I think Florida's a pretty underrated team. They got a good offensive line. Anthony Richardson, heck of a skill set. Uh, overall, though, I think that one thing to watch in this game is what will they do against this SEC front. Can Tavion Thomas and a veteran offensive line grind these guys down? I think that's one thing that kind of key in on is, you know, Cam Rising as well. You know, he's a dual threat guy, 20 touchdowns, 2,500 yards after taking over in the San Diego State game, 6'2", 220. He's really evolved as a leader here. You know, this offense has a lot of balance, though, Nick. I think that's the biggest thing, 191 through the air. I think they had around 200 on the ground as well. The thing for me is they get back two great tight ends. Grant Cooley, 6'2", 230. 42, great ball skills for him. These guys were top three on the team receiving last year, combined with 14 touchdowns. Can Florida match up with these guys? Amari Bernie's a veteran. Ventrell Miller comes back. He's going to be great for trying to stop this running game. But I don't know if they can do that. Jason Marshall, Trey Dean, one of those guys might be tasked with trying to cover one of these tight ends. It's going to be a very interesting game for me, Nick. You know, what kind of what's kind of your thoughts on this matchup here? Because I think the Gators can compete, but the Utah Utes are certainly the better team. This is a huge matchup for the Pac-12. You know, these are Utah and USC are two teams that have playoff aspirations. This is a make-or-break game for Utah early on in the season, traveling to the Swamp. I take a lot of value in a home team's atmosphere, and the Swamp is one of the toughest places to play. I was there last year. Could hardly hear myself think in there. I know it's going to be allowed for Billy Napier's first game. I love Anthony Richardson. The skill set he has is insane. He possesses so much talent across the board. I love to see him be involved in both facets of the offense. I want to see what he can do on Saturday night. And then I look at the Utah offense. I think Cam Rising is a fantastic quarterback. Utah or Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year last year. Partnered up with Tavion Thomas, who's just one of the best backs in college football currently for me. Love the speed he possesses, what he can do on the ground. I think this game will be a little bit closer than you do just because I think that Utah might make some mistakes early on, some penalties early on due to the loud crowd and find themselves a little uncomfortable situation. This is a tough, true road test for Utah. I like them to win this game. I like them to set themselves up to start off the season well as they try to push for that playoff, hopefully, and win the Pac-12. This is a huge game, one of the most important games of the weekend. My my favorite game on the weekend. Should be a lot of fun to watch this one. Yeah, I mean, the noise is certainly a concern, but they had their own noisy crowds last year. I don't know how much it really compares to a SEC crowd, but they packed the house for a lot of home games, especially the Oregon one where they were going crazy. Tavion Thomas, 21 rushing touchdowns is a school record, but the Florida offensive 
rotation is not a slouch. Montreal Johnson, the Sunbelt freshman of the year, follows Napier over. Naquan Wright was a kind of small player from them last year. The biggest thing for me is outside speed, a wide receiver is kind of a concern. You know, that impressive depth they had from years back is, you know, kind of cycled out. Justin Shorter, you have to play a big role this year. Maybe your head was a bit of a disappointment last year. Dejon Reynolds, you know, he's a guy they like as a route runner. We'll see what happens with the receivers, though, because I don't really think they match up too well here against Clark Phillips, who was, you know, a great playmaker, swath away balls, forces fumbles. So even if you have that size like Shorter does at 6'5", then it's not going to do much for you when you have Phillips covering you. And also a veteran on the other side, Jatavis Brown, Cole Bishop I like. If someone gets pulled out, one of those three guys gets ejected for targeting or goes down with, you know, cramps or something. I'm not very cons- I'm not very confident in the depth of this Utah defensive back, though. That's one thing we kind of focused on. And, you know, harping on that run game, Osiris Torrance leading things now at guard. Pretty good offensive line for the Gators. I was pretty impressed with it when I was doing my offseason research. They're facing a young group of linebackers, Nick Mohamed Diabadi, transfers from Florida to kind of lead this group. But Lander Barton, Ethan Kelver, you know, these are two young guys that are going to get involved. And the vertical, you know, running game of Florida could really possess a threat here. So I think this defensive line led by Gabe Reed, who's a heck of a run stopper coming over from Clemson, Van Fillinger, who was phenomenal last year, players that stepped up on the deep line. Then Junior Tafuna, another stout freshman from a season ago. These guys are really going to have to kind of carry the load because these linebackers could really be in for a long day. Like you said, going on the road with crowd and trying to cover this vertical running game. I can definitely see that giving Florida some issues. I just love the matchups because, again, the secondary, I think, matches up well against the receivers, but the linebackers might be outpaced by the running backs. Fun game overall. We're going to learn a lot. I don't really care who wins this game. I'll be rooting for Utah in this one, mainly because I picked them. But I also think Florida's going to be a heck of a football team this season. What are your thoughts on kind of things I just said? Yeah, I certainly think that this is a team, this is a game that I want to see Utah win because I think this tells us a whole lot about the Pac-12 sustainability long-term thing. Come down and win this game. They're also getting paid $500,000 to go play this game. Imagine winning a game while getting paid five hundred grand from a different school. Interesting way for that to happen. I kind of would like to see that unfold. But I think this also tells a lot about Florida. If they can hang in this game and look good on offense, I think they'll be very set under Billy Napier. I think he was the right hire. I like the direction Florida's going. I think last year, of course, they were a whole mess. But I think they found their footing. I like Anthony Richardson a lot. I think he's going to continue to develop into a great quarterback in college. This season will be a big year for him. I'm excited for this game. I think it will tell us a lot about both teams, but at the same time, it won't tell us enough about both teams. Very interesting matchup, and I'm very excited for this one across the board. New center Paul Molly versus defensive tackle Gervin Dexter is another fun matchup to watch. And one last thing on Richardson is I put high percentage situations because last year they didn't do that at the end of that Georgia game. Remember, they're up 3 nothing at half. And it was 24 nothing in just a handful of minutes because he had three straight turnovers. He also had a bad pick against LSU late in the game where they could have tied things up. Um, so put him in high percentage situations because that was a big problem with him last year. Obviously, with more maturity, more experience, I expect it to go down. That's not a guarantee until we see it. So I think that's one thing to watch with Anthony Richardson. Moving to top game of the weekend, top five matchup here, Notre Dame versus Ohio State. The Buckeyes, nation's top offense, no doubter there. C.J. Stroud, after a phenomenal season last year, I expected – I had high expectations for him, but I didn't expect him to do what he did last year or showcase the confidence he did, you know, fourth and five in the Rose Bowl. And this guy's not looking at the sticks. He's looking at the end zone because Marvin Harrison wins his matchup. And he has just ridiculous confidence. And he's able to translate that to great accuracy, pinpoint precision with his throws. Jackson Smith, Nick Jigba, I think he has a pretty good matchup here against the secondary. Brandon Joseph, obviously, is coming over at safety. But from a cornerback perspective, I don't like Houston Griffith trying to cover him. Cam Hart, you know, he's physical, but he certainly struggled. Clarence Lewis was not good in the Fiesta Bowl. D.J. Brown, he might get involved. I'm very concerned in this game for Notre Dame. I think it's going to be the game where they really watch the tape. It's, it's week one, so it's kind of tough to say that. But they're going to look back at this tape, and it's going to really make them angry. And they're really going to want to progress. I think the rest of the year after this gun test, after they get beat up against these you know, five-star receivers, Julian Fleming, Amika Mugba, these guys are just going to have a field day, I think, through the air. Um, Trayvon Henderson on the ground, I think he'll do his damage as well. But I do think that Notre Dame – kind of being slept on in this game because Ohio State last year, Jim Knowles comes over, implements this new defensive scheme, which, you know, might be a struggle. Tanner McAllister comes over and kind of help these guys learn. But still, I mean, they were very soft last year, Nick. They had one sack in the three biggest games of the year back in 2021. They lost to Oregon and Michigan, you know, what was, you know, like 10 or 11 game difference, and nothing had changed against the run. They were just completely poor. The personnel certainly there. You know, guys like Jack Sawyer are going to get involved. We'll see factor some more uh, production, but overall, they were very soft against the run. Notre Dame, pretty good offensive line. They were pretty bad early on in the season, which was disappointing, but they were also down to their third-string tackle. You know, Blake Fisher's back, though. This guy was great 
in the Fiesta Bowl. He came back against Oklahoma State, didn't allow a single sack on 70 dropbacks against the nation's top pass rush. Garrett Patterson's the nation's best center, an elite run blocker. Also didn't give up a sack. I thought Josh Love really started to find his flow at the end of the year. Zeke Carell is also there to provide some depth. These guys are going to be able to pound the ball with ease if Ohio State's secondary or defensive line and linebackers are as soft as they were last year, Nick, because Chris Tyree has plenty of speed, and Buckner has the size and the speed as well to do damage at quarterback. Obviously, going to Columbus, your first career start is not easy for the former four-star, but I think the tight ends are going to be very key in this game because Michael Mayer, he's not just a heck of a pass catcher. He can block on the edge as well. I think Mitchell Evans and Kevin Bauman are going to play a big role because, like I said, all of the line starting to get things going, and these tight ends can match that. Uh, energy, then Ohio State's run defense can be in for a long night. I agree. This is an interesting matchup. You know, I like this early on in the season. I just think that Ohio State's offense has way too much for Notre Dame's defense to keep up with. I love C.J. Stroud. I think the two of them together are so fire. When you look at the run game as well, I think they'll be able to ground and pound the ball. I want to see this offense be on the field. Big plays from them a lot. But I do think there's defensive concern with Ohio State. If you see my score prediction, I think Notre Dame will score a lot of points. I think this will be a close game in the second half. Late, early in the second half, but I think Ohio State will pull away towards the end of the game. I think the offense will just have enough energy to outpace Notre Dame. I just think that the defense needs to show me something this week because I'm really concerned about this Ohio State defense. That's why I'm cautious about them going to the, will go to the playoff, but I think their defense is the one thing that can certainly hold them back. I did not see anything I wanted to see out of that defense. It looked poor across the board last year. Can this defense step up under Jim Knowles? Is the 4-2-5 transition going to work? I think we'll see a lot though week one that can kind of help us understand what this team's going to look like on defense throughout the season. Ohio State offensive line, guys like Paris Johnson, Luke Weipler, Juan Jones, these guys are great. They're facing one of the more experienced D-lines in CFB that no one wants to give credit to. Isaiah Foskey comes back, 11 sacks, six forced fumbles. This guy can make plays off the edge of a high-energy first step, great length and some nice leg drop. I do think that his range allows him to knock the, way, the ball away a lot. And that's one thing that can really keep him in this game is just simple plays like that. Because um, if you can force turnovers on this offense, you're going to be setting yourself up for success. Justin and Jason Edemiola, these guys were second and third on the team in sacks. Riley Mills gave them good reps, 6'5", 283. They also picked up a 300-pounder from Harvard. Six of the top seven leaders in sacks are back, and then they pick up a guy like that. So I think this D-line... They can kind of control things here and, you know, put them in long third down situations and come off the edge and make some plays. And that'd be really great for this offense. JT Bertrand, Bo Bauer, Jack Pizer, these guys are all veteran linebackers at this point. Bertrand, he's still kind of progressing in the open field, but he does have speed. He's a physical imposer as well. And, you know, I think they can really set the tone for this defense because Ohio State, they don't know nothing about physicality if you look at last year's tape. So I think it's something that can really kind of shift things here for Marcus Freeman and his group. Overall, though, Ohio State, You've seen it against Michigan. You know, they're going to get their yards regardless, but the big plays are key to their success. So can the defensive secondary hold up in the back? So Marcus Freeman's going to want to play press, man. It's not going to work against these guys. You're going to have to figure something else out. I don't know if that means blitz seven or eight guys, but, I mean, that won't work either. So I do think this defense, even though I've given it a lot of praise this offseason, especially on the front seven, I think they're going to be a little outmatched here, as is everybody that plays Ohio State this year. So I think 45-30 is respectable. Notre Dame will have their success, but Ohio State in the second half, they really start to put things together. Um... I think it's going to be a good game. I hope it is. Notre Dame, Notre Dame the cover for me. For the Buckeyes, they will do their job on offense. And we'll just see what Jim Knowles' defense does because um, Notre Dame, the, their wide receiver core is pretty concerning. You know, with Avery Davis touring his ACL, I do think that uh, Braden Lindsey, Lorenzo Styles, those guys are going to have to really step up. And I think they're certainly capable of it. But I think overall, uh, this will be a fun game. We'll, we'll be able to learn a lot from Ohio State's defense. 45-30 again for me, Nick. What are your final thoughts on this game? Yeah, I think it's going to be, I think Notre Dame will cover the spread. 17 and a half is a bit of a lofty spread for them in Columbus. I, I think this offense for Ohio State, we know what we're going to expect out of them. It's just the defense. What are we going to see for the defense? I'm going to be analyzing that all week once you get the film on that, because I think that's the key to this Ohio State team. Can the defense improve under Jim Knowles? And they got to improve a whole lot. We'll see that week one. I'm excited to see what Notre Dame looks like, too. A lot of people say they're a bit overrated. If they can keep up in Columbus, maybe that talk will be quiet down a little bit. We'll see. You have to see how that goes. Certainly a big opportunity to earn some respect for the Irish. Oh, some other notable games on the nightcap. Probably the best part of the week one schedule. Army, Coastal Carolina, Grayson McCall versus that. Uh, great running game by Army. I'll take the Black Knights in that one. Utah State, I'll take them to cover a massive 41-point line against Alabama. 11 win team from a season ago. Did struggle against UConn. Kind of like I said, though, they couldn't stop a run last year, and then the Huskies dominated them. So expect a big day from the running backs for Bama. Keep Bryce Young's day cool and simple. Georgia State, South Carolina, don't sleep on that running game. You know, Jameis Williams, a former Running back in Georgia, uh, South Carolina is at Georgia State. Those guys are really good. You know, I wouldn't sleep on that because South Carolina, 
I have high expectations for them, but they're running defense. Kind of struggled at times last year. Louisville Syracuse, more underrated game there. Sean Tucker versus Malik Cunningham. Expect a lot of ground game in this one. And then Boise State and Oregon State. That should be a fun little game. The cap for the night. Yeah, I like the Louisville Syracuse game. That's a very underrated game. Lines four and a half points for Louisville on the road in Syracuse. Going to be the first time to have a full capacity crowd inside the dome in Syracuse since before COVID. I have some friends of mine that go up there and tell me they're expecting a sellout crowd potentially. So that would be an exciting thing to see. I think that would be the dome is a tough place to play when those guys are getting rowdy. South Carolina, you know, they need to show me a lot this week against Georgia State. We have both of us are very high on them. I have them winning the East. I want to see them go out and absolutely dominate a Georgia State team that is pretty solid considering where they play. Alabama against Utah State. Alabama should put away Utah State with ease, but that line is ridiculous. 41 points is a lot of points. I don't think Nick Saban will cover that. Army Coastal Carolina, is Grace McCall going to live up to the hype that he's had in the past? Need to see a lot of him this year. I know this defense is not that great for Army, but can he kind of find his groove early on, get comfortable? I want to see what he can do this season. Big season for McCall. Looking at Florida State and LSU, you know, one thing you said to me the other day was that Florida State really shows up on these Sunday games, and that reminded me that they do. And I think they will here as well, because I'm very excited for this team. Jordan Travis, at quarterback, a running game that had three different running backs, have 100-plus yards against an FCS squad. I don't know if they'll even hit 100, though, in this one, unless they get on the edge and make plays with Travis and Krishan Ward and the speed option, because I think that's really where they can make their money. Because this offensive line, even though they added some guys like Bless Harris and then, you know, Caden Miles, who's injured, the theme here is to improve the run blocking. You know, Robert Scott, Dylan Gibbons, these guys are pretty good in that category. This offensive line still has some strides to make, and they're playing an LSU defense. It's absolutely nasty. Gets back Ali Gay, Jacqueline Roy, Mason Smith. Those guys are going to continue to grow. I like uh, BJ Ojulari off the edge. They picked up a Makai Wingo. And they also have the linebackers, Micah Baskerville, who's, you know, very good sideline to sideline. And Mike Jones, who's an asset in coverage, if they want to, you know, implement some wrinkles with Ward, potentially run a wheel routes or something, you know. I think Matt House is really going to let Mike Jones thrive this year. I think that Florida State can compete in this game. I like what they have a wide receiver. Guys like Johnny Wilson are 6'7", 230. I mean, that's pretty ridiculous size for him. Micah Pittman coming over. You know, Ontario Wilson, Keyshawn Hilton, some veterans. Mike Norville, I think, really likes this offense that he has here a lot. That we're going to find out about LSU, though, because it's a two-way battle at quarterback, it appears. You know, Brian Kelly says it's a tactical advantage to wait and announce the starter. But I think Jaden Daniels gets what Mike Denbrock had the last four years in Jaden. Uh, not Jaden Daniels. He's kind of comparison to... That of Desmond Ritter, a very similar player with his dual threat abilities, his athleticism, they can do through the through the air. So I think Daniels is going to be the starter here. It's kind of obvious, at least based on what I just said and what I've seen from the past. The running game wasn't exactly great last year, so we'll see if Florida State, who has a pretty good interior D-line led by Robert Cooper, can kind of get things going. Uh, I think the lack of pass rush of Jermaine Johnson and Kier kind of concerns Jared Verse. We're going to see if he's unleashed in this game. Highly coveted FCS transfer. Um, Fabian Lovett, Jared Jackson, some other disruptive guys on the interior D-line. We'll see. I think it was against that line. It was not all that good last year, Nick. I mean, pass protection was a little bit better than uh, most said. But in terms of run blocking, it wasn't. You know, 114 yards per game as a team is not good. I think uh, the secondary is going to kind of struggle. I don't think I give him a lot of credit. But Jamie Robinson's a stud. Uh, Tatum Bethune coming over a linebacker. He's a great player as well. But overall, I think the secondary, they're not going to match up well against Kayshawn Beauty. Uh, Malik Neighbors, Jack Beach, a deep group of pass catchers here. I think this is going to be a fun game, but like I said about the defensive matchup for LSU and then the wide receiver matchup for their offense, I think those are the big keys to watch, and that will be the reason why they win this game. This is an exciting game. You know, Florida State last year played on Sunday night. They played Notre Dame, took them to overtime in a game I don't think anyone expected Florida State to even be competitive with Notre Dame. I'm excited. Game. This is one of my. This is my favorite game of the week. I love the matchup here. I think it's just super exciting. They'll tell us a lot about both teams. Last week, of course, Florida State played FCS Duquesne. Looked good, but obviously FCS, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Treshawn Ward had a great night, 127 yards, and two scores for him. Like to see him be involved early. Can he get around that defensive line for, for LSU? The defensive line is strong. The interior defensive line, especially one of the best in college football, very underrated. Not a lot of folks talking about them. Can he beat the defensive line? Can the offensive line for for Florida State? make the holes for Ward and give him some opportunity to pick up some ground game. I think that's a huge key to this. Jordan Travis as well. Will he have a good night? Had a good night in the, against the FCS team. Can he kind of find his rhythm early on? I look at the LSU offense. I love Keyshawn Boutte and the wide, rest of the wide receiving core. If Daniels is the starter, I think that's a solid pick. I like to see him air it out early on, potentially. This is an exciting game. I think this will tell us a lot of 
both teams. I think it's going to be a close game. It's going to be down to the wire. I think LSU will pull it out late. But this is a game that a lot of folks should watch. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think both these programs are strong, going to have strong seasons heading in the right direction. I agree. It should be a close game for most of the four quarters. I have LSU pulling their away slightly at the end. And the captain's off in week one, Monday night, Clemson against Georgia Tech. You know, I don't expect this to be close one bit. 35-point victory for me. They only beat them at home 14-8 last year. And if the QB didn't fumble late, maybe they lose that game. So, of course, it's hard to say that. So, take it with a grain of salt. But overall, I think Clemson's very angry and Brent Venables departing a watch because Jeff Sims, they can really do a lot with his legs. He's a pretty good quarterback, especially if they use him correctly. Overall, Georgia Tech, not very talented. Top to bottom, you know, the roster still has issues trying to overcome that schematic change. I think this will be GF Collins last year there in Atlanta. But again, Sims, his legs, that'll be something to watch. What would they do without Venables, that defensive coordinator? How will they, you know, how would Wes Goodwin adjust? I think that's what the biggest thing to watch here, along with the quarterback battle, Cade Klubnik and uh, DJ Uyungle. They're also not very deep at wide receiver. There's some guy to EJ Williams. There's some guys there. But after that, who's going to step up and make plays? Overall, this should be a blowout, Nick. This should not be close one bit. Clemson, you know, I think they're going to be really fired up for this one. That's the expectation. Disappointed. This should be a blowout, but it has potential to be a close game, especially in the first half. This is a huge game for Georgia Tech. Obviously, they don't get a whole lot of opportunities to play on prime time. They're going to play in Atlanta against the Clemson team. It's kind of figuring out an offense, transitioning with two new coordinators on both sides of the ball. This could be a close game in the first half, but I think Clemson just has too much talent. That Georgia Tech depth chart is looking very weak. I think Clemson will pull away easily and end up with a huge victory. But I think it'll tell us a lot about the Clemson offense, you know, who is DJ going to be throwing to? Are those weapons that or lack of weapons going to be able to step up? Is Will Shipley going to have a good night? He's going to be relying on a lot on the load early on a lot. Will Dabo make a quarterback switch? Been saying this all off season. Got to see how DJ looks on Monday night. I'm excited to see if he can kind of live up to the hype and potential that he's had in the past against what is a pretty poor Georgia Tech team. But they played him close last year. I think there's no reason why they can't play him close in the first half again this year. I'm excited to watch this game. It gives us a lot. We're going to learn a lot about Clemson early on. It's going to end up as a blowout, but I think the smaller pieces that we're going to learn about the offense, potentially the defense, is going to be huge as Clemson team. I want to see how they can adjust and what they can do here on a Monday night slate. Kind of like the Michigan-Colorado State game. Yeah, we expect a big final score, but the point of the look, you know, like how will the Clemson off- interior offensive line look? You know, how will the defense kind of gel together? There's plenty to look for, QBs included. So 45-10 for me. Nick has 42-14, a blowout on Monday night. Uh, hopefully we're not disappointed because that would just be unfortunate. Uh, Dale Sweeney, big fan of his. So hopefully Clemson can get things going in the right direction this season. That's going to be after this episode. As always, Nick, thank you for joining me. Very excited to have college football back this weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm very excited for this. A lot of good games on here. My, my three favorite games, you know, Florida State, LSU, Louisville, Syracuse, and then uh, Rutgers, Boston College. My three favorite games this week, the games I'm watching the most. Excited for those matchups. Yep, excited for all of them, even though it is kind of a week. It's nice to have. Finally back, we made it. See you guys next time.